Welcome all of you joining us by video wherever you are across the world. You're welcome to Belfast tonight. And we're turning to Romans chapter 9, beginning at verse number 14. Can I just again repeat that I'll not deal in great detail uh, from verse number 25 to 33. I'll go, go across it very quickly. Basically, uh, Paul is saying that the subject he's been discussing has been discussed before by Hosea, verses 25 and 26, by Isaiah, verse 27, 28, and 29. And then he brings the application, verse 30 to verse 33. So we'll not deal with those in detail, but we will deal in detail from verse 14 down to verse 24. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, O man, who art thou that replast against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. What of God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, or prepared to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had aforetime prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them, them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall ye be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now you have seen last week through Gilbert's teaching that Israel's rejection of Christ, point number one in your note sheet, does not mean that the plan and the purpose of God is of no effect. Because Jews don't accept Jesus as the Messiah doesn't mean that God has failed. And from the earliest times, the descendants of Abraham were actually divided into two groups. There have been those who carried on the purpose of God and those who did not. And you saw that regarding Jacob and Esau last week, and you saw that regarding uh, Isaac and Ishmael. And in fact, we have faced the question as to the principle on which God chose Isaac to be the vessel to carry his purposes, and not Hagar's son, Ishmael. Now, this is very important. 
You'll notice point three on your note sheet on what principle did God choose Isaac and not Ishmael? Well, it was not because he wanted to damn one and save the other. Let me say categorically in this pulpit tonight, I don't believe that God creates anybody willing them to be damned. I don't think the Scripture teaches that. Although you might think that this passage does, that's why it's such an important passage. And there may be somebody sitting in here tonight and you think that you are damned already. You say, I'm not one of the elect, so therefore I am damned. There's no hope for me. There's no point in preaching to me. If you're like that, my friend, I know that you probably tossed and turned with this for months and years. So if only you are helped. And God uses me, humbly speaking tonight, God uses me in this pulpit to clear your mind of a lot of nonsense that has maybe been put into it by well-meaning people who have just about ditched your life. If I am helped to do that tonight by God, then this meeting will not be in vain. I met a girl last week, I think she was from London, and she stopped me as I was walking along one morning. She said, Derek, I want to speak to you. She said, somebody told me that I was sick because I had sinned against God. She was a Christian. And her face was as quiet as a ghost, and she certainly looked ill. And she said, I thought, well, if that's the way it is, and the Lord doesn't want me, and I'm on the scrap heap anyway, or more or less, that's what she said. She said, there was no point in going on with my Christian life. But I thought I'd come to Skegness just for a week before going off. And she said, you said in the meeting one morning how that there's a difference between chastisement and punishment. Punishment fell on Christ's head at Calvary, and the punishment for sin is over, and God will not punish you for sin if you're in Christ. He will chastise you, but there's all the difference between chastising uh, a child and punishing the child for sin. And the child of God too. And she said, I felt like jumping up in the middle of the meeting and shouting because it had answered my problem. Now that was only one line or two lines in a whole week's messages. But if that girl, I think her name was Jane, was the only one helped all week, then I'd go 10,000 miles because that girl has tossed and turned with that for months thinking God was punishing her for her sin. When Christ was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And punishment God will not twice demand first at my bleeding surety's hand and then again at mine. And if there's somebody in here tonight and you are in that position, then my friend, are you watching me? Are you listening to me? Maybe traveling down some motorway. Maybe sitting in a hospital somewhere. Maybe lying in a bed. Maybe sitting in a corner. Listening to your earphones, through your earphones or wherever. You may even be jogging. I know one fellow who sets off with a Tuesday night tape on his motorbike and he listens to a message as soon as he switches it on, as soon as he goes out the gate all the way to his work. And the message is over by the time he gets to work, so you'll know he has a long way to go to work. You'll never know who's listening. And if you are listening here tonight, I want you to see, and this is very, very important, God did not choose Isaac because he was better than Ishmael. It, or because he wanted to save Isaac and damn Ishmael. God willeth not the death of any. It was not on the basis, point 3a, never forget this, it was not on the basis of salvation and damnation. Now, maybe some of you don't understand what I'm saying by choosing Isaac. You remember that God promised Abraham a little boy and that through him he would make a great nation, the Jewish nation. But of course, Sarah whispered in his ear, 
and said, I think you should help God along and you should have a child by that slave girl over there from Egypt, the Egyptian Hagar. And Abram listened to his wife, had a child through Hagar, and God said, no, the nation will not be, be carried on through the seed of Ishmael. But it was not on the basis of salvation or damnation, nor was it on the basis of merit that one was better than the other. And this is very important. Jacob was not chosen instead of Esau because he was better than Esau. In fact, he was a lot worse. Why did the Lord choose Peter and James and John to be apostles? Was that because they were especially holy men, especially qualified to be apostles? No. Peter was a foul-mouthed fisherman. James and John were the sons of thunder. And, you know, they were bad-tempered. Thomas was a doubter. And so on and so forth. They were not chosen because they were holier than anybody else. You remember when Peter was, was used by God with his friend on the steps of the temple to, to heal, in that marvelous time, the man who was lame. And the man started to dance like a heart with joy that he was no longer lame. And the people's mouths were open at this fantastic miracle. And they came round with their open mouths looking at Peter. You remember what Peter said? Why do you look on us? As though by our own power or our own godliness we have done this. Don't think it's because we're better than you are. I always say it, and it's important. Jonah was a real rebel against God, and he ran away from God's will. And as he was lying as a rebel in the hold of the ship, going right, sailing right out of the will of God, the entire ship's company were converted. And God used him, even when he was rebelling. So let nobody ever say that it's on the basis of goodness, because I was good, that the Lord used me. On what grounds did the Lord call you to that holy task that you're doing at the moment behind the desk? He says it a holy task? Well, of course it is. Even the pots and pans in the tabernacle were holy unto the Lord. John Pantry has a lovely song about it that I was listening to in a car the other day as I was traveling. I know John Pantry, a good, a good filly he is. And he sings some great songs, Bible-based. And he's got a song about every pot and every pan, holy to the Lord. And he's dead right behind that desk. Your task is holy to the Lord. Raising those children in your home is holy to the Lord. Running that business is holy to the Lord. Working in that home, cleaning that home, doing household duties as unto the Lord. Working in that hospital, teaching that school class, being a university student working hard at your exams at school or whatever, writing essays for your teachers. You say, don't remind me of it. Well, according to some of the essays I was handed in, folks, it sure didn't look as if they were thinking it was holy to the Lord. It wasn't even holy to the teacher. But it's important. Who called you to be a witness in that garage where you work as a mechanic? Who called you to be a witness there? Who equipped you for this holy task? Because of your own special holiness. Because you're better than your next door neighbor. Of course not. Perish the thought. Now let me say something. It's very important. It's also very controversial. Listen carefully. It was not that God had a scheme for salvation 
and then left it up to volunteers to come and volunteer to go with this message of salvation and chose the best that he could get the hold of. And it was left up entirely to the volunteers whether or not this scheme of salvation would work. To hear some people talk, you would think that that was so. If that were so, and it depended entirely upon whether or not the Christian church and the people in it were good and did what the Lord told them, that would propound the heinous theory that somebody could be in hell forever because you slipped and fell and didn't fulfill your duty. And we believe, as Luther taught, that salvation is by faith alone and Europe was open to the Renaissance and a mighty spiritual awakening when he taught that truth. But I think sometimes even evangelicals are going back into the dark ages with this kind of uh, propounding a theory that if you slip up and feel that somebody will be in hell forever because of it. That would be going back to a salvation by works. And you didn't do the work, so they perish. It is not a salvation by works. And I want to knock this with all my heart and with all my soul. Lest someone should go through life broken because they feel the Lord in a certain area and they think that person is in hell forever because of me entirely. Obviously, there's a balance to that teaching that we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and we have a duty to do that. We have a royal duty to do that. A great privilege to do that. But the salvation of a soul in the final analysis is not going to stand or fall on whether you kept the standard or didn't. Praise God that we serve a bigger God than that. A far bigger God than that. God chooses his witnesses not according to their work. Notice that verse number 16 teaches you that. It is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. You would think, the way some people teach the Bible, that salvation across the world depends on those who run, depends on those who will and decide. No. This is teaching us the great doctrine of the sovereign mercy of God. Now some people think that this is very unfair. Verse 14 says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid that God should choose one to be a vessel for him and another not an apostle or whatever. Well, of course, just remember before I leave the point that he chose Isaac on a principle of promise. He said, I'm going to use Isaac. He chose Jacob on a principle of promise. 
And it was not on a question of merit or salvation and damnation. It was a promise that he made. That's the way the seed would come, right down through Mary, etc. He chose it at every point. And Gilbert made the point very tenderly and very carefully, and it really challenged me last week, as last week's message, as I heard it, and I just reiterate it again. If God chooses you to be a youth leader in your local church, no matter who shouts or no matter who's against it, if the Lord has equipped you and sent you into it, you get on with it. Because he's chosen you for it. And if God has given you blessing in the work in which you are involved, then go on with it. I wasn't chosen to be a D.L. Moody. I was sent to a city of trouble at this time to teach in this pulpit these deep things of God. It would not have been of my choosing. If I'd been an evangelist like I was seven or eight years ago, I never would have studied the Bible to the depth I have had to study it to teach you. I wouldn't even have had to deal with the vast majority of problems that I have to deal with. Because when you deal with expository preaching week by week, you can't duck around the difficult passages. You've got to face them and go through them. It wouldn't have been of my choosing, but God chose it. So I've got to get on with it. And so have you, my friend. And it's not on the basis of merit. It is on the basis of God's choosing. And he equips you and sends you forth to serve him. And he promises. He promises he'll be with you. And you'll have everything you need to do the work that he sends you into. You'll have it. I've just been amazed these days, down to the very chairs that I sit on in my own study, God has provided at this time. I was just thinking that today. Through an amazing set of circumstances, which I wouldn't want to talk about in public. It's amazing. God sends you on a job, then his promise is the thing that will take you through. So you lean on it. It's on the basis of promise. And as I say something, it's unfair. Is it just that the Lord chooses Mary and Martha and Peter and Paul and he leaves aside Caiaphas and the rest of them? And they were the bad boys. The high priest who had Christ flogged and so on. They were the bad fellows and the others were good. Mary and Martha and Peter and Paul. Is it just merely that he chooses those and doesn't choose the others? Well, no. The answer is actually given in this amazing passage. And we'll have to think very deeply. So stay with me. We'll have to consider a number of things. And the first thing that Paul takes is an analogy of a potter. Now, here is a potter. I often tell you about the trip that I had to Israel on one occasion and I went to the house of a potter and I thought it was so dead easy I had to go at it. You want to see, friends, my right hand didn't know what my left hand was doing. You want to see what I came out with. The most cock-eyed piece of pottery you have ever seen in your life. But I thought it was, wasn't bad at all and I, uh, well, for me anyway, and I put it in the back of the bus and lo and behold, I forgot it. And it's still traveling around Jerusalem or somewhere. as probably on a scrap heap long ago. I've had a go in the potter's house at trying to form it with my hands. Interesting experience. Now from verse 15 to verse 21, the whole passage is based upon this idea of a potter. Notice it in verse 21, that a potter has power over the clay, but please let me hit the right note. Notice what the verse says. The potter has power over the clay of the same lump. Not two lumps. The same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. He has the right to make of this same lump. Two different kinds of people will emerge from this lump that he's working on. Some will be to honor, and some will be to dishonor. But notice what Paul is teaching, that all men are the same. 
all women, and you agree with this, don't you, are the same. You say, are they? Men and women are the same. You'd be amazed if you took off tonight from here and went to preach the gospel in some far off place that the very things that you preach here in Ireland, Christian, they will respond to you because their hearts are the same, their needs are the same. Why is it that millions of people, Catholics and Protestants and atheists and army commanders and, you know, bin men and surgeons, why do millions of them feed on the Psalms of David? Because the Psalms of David are all about a man who failed many of them. And how he repented of his sin. And all of us have failed and know what it's like. And we can identify with David in some form or other. Because everybody's the same. In our hearts, it's the same lump. You say, well, there's a fair big lump in my office and he won't listen to the gospel. <laughs> and there's a fair lump somewhere else who just is impervious to any witness I might have. How do you know? Deep down in his heart and her heart, there are deep needs and they have a soul just like you do. And some may be against it and some may be for it, but we keep on witnessing. Not on the basis of merit, but on the basis of promise that God promises to use his word. Not our goodness. In that sense, for being chosen. Not saying that you shouldn't lead a clean life. Not saying that you shouldn't have a clean mouth. And your good works, that they would do it before them that... The, you know, that the world will see and glorify your Father which is in heaven, but you're not chosen on that basis to be a witness. It's the same lump, all men are the same. And when Paul then begins to cite two examples of two examples in history coming out of the same lump of clay, that is the children of Israel and Pharaoh. When he begins to cite the case of Israel and then Pharaoh, he cites that part of their history that makes it very clear, folks, what a very evil, bad lump of clay they both were. They both were. Not just one was good and the other bad. The same lump of clay, God working and molding with it, one went on eventually to honor in many ways, and the other didn't. But it was the same lump of clay, and God applied pressure on both. But they were both bad lumps, or it was a bad lump to start with. Notice that verse number 15, which is his, his uh, quotation for his teaching, he said, you remember God said to Moses, he said, you remember he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Who was that spoken to, everybody? That was spoken to the children of Israel whenever they made the golden calf. What a bad lump they were. You know the story, how God blessed them and they came out of Egypt, and they were no sooner across the Red Sea and had the blessing of God than they started an orgy, and they made a golden calf, and they bowed down and worshipped it while Moses was away up the mountain. And they said, ah, the preacher's gone away and he's forgotten all about us. So they went for immorality and sin and evil and materialism. And Moses was so mad when he came down the mountain at the unspirituality of the people of God, he smashed. He smashed the stone on which the law was written. Yet God said to him, Moses, Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But nobody can tell me that they were a lovely lump of clay without any impurities, because they weren't. He had mercy on them. And then he comes in to this fantastic passage about Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh lived at the same time. 
And as God was molding the people of God, he started to mold out of the same lump of clay this character Pharaoh. And Moses was told to take his rod and to cast it on the waters of Egypt that they become blood. But the magicians did the same. And then again, as if Pharaoh was looking for more evidence as to whether or not God was real and that the God they wanted to go and worship in the wilderness was real, he asked in a sense for more evidence. And if you ask God for evidence about himself, he'll give you plenty. You, if you're here tonight and you're an atheist or you're an agnostic, you ask God for evidence about his existence, my friend, and he'll not be long showing it to you. He'll have mercy on you, as he did on Pharaoh. You say, was Pharaoh created to damnation? No, he certainly was not. God had mercy on him. You remember the plague of frogs? We were doing this last night with our children at home, or two of them. You can imagine which two. And we were doing the plague of frogs. And one of the questions in the little uh, SU uh, booklet about it was, you know, write down in one word how you would feel if your house had frogs all over it, and one of the twins wrote, excited. <laughs> and the other twin wrote, slimy. <laughs> Both, I was going to say, the same lump of clay. <laughs> the mother mightn't like that. Frogs, you remember it? Please, he says, look, he says, I'm sick of these frogs. Please, take them away and you can go and worship your God. All right. God took them away, but he hardened his heart. No, you're not going. He was an evil lump of clay. Then God sent the flies. Then he sent the pestilence of animals, the hail, the locusts. And right down the line, I want you to see this clearly. God had mercy on Pharaoh. Six times. God gave him a chance to repent. But he kept saying no. And then he came to the point which I believe it's possible for you to come to if you're not a Christian of saying no to God once too often. And instead of Pharaoh hardening his heart, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh found it impossible to change. He cried out to Moses once more, I have sinned. What a fool I have been. You say, will a man cry out to God and God refused to take notice? God took notice many times. But you can push God too far. And then he stops taking notice. God took away plague after plague, but then he passed a point where he said no once too many times. God hardens his heart, and he stands in history as a beacon light. To millions and millions on earth, that God is a God of mercy. But if you refuse his offer of mercy again and again, and again, and again, and again, he can stop. Why did God do it? Verse 22. Now, let's hit the right note. And I'll give you the balance on that teaching in a moment in case some of you are getting frightened. What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make his power known, because God can show wrath, you know, as well as love. There's more about God's wrath in the Bible than there is about God's love. 
not often pointed out. It's another side to his character that's very important. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make us power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And of course, Pharaoh was very much this vessel of wrath. But what if God endured all his insults? That's an amazing little verse. That's why God did it. He endured it that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had aforetime prepared unto glory. What it's basically saying is you can't forever trifle with God. And God will endure your insults and your coldness. And you're saying no, and not yet. And I'll be saved when I'm dying, but not tonight. There's this girl in my life, and I love her, and she doesn't love the Savior, but I don't care. I'd rather have her than have my soul saved, so I refuse Christ. Be careful, my friend. Don't harden your neck and stiffen your neck against God's grace and mercy, because he that hardeneth his neck, the Bible teaches, can suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. I mean, what else would you expect God to be? I ask you, what would you have done with a man like Pharaoh? He persecutes the children of Israel in slave labor camps and is called on by God to repent and to be saved and forgiven and to let Israel go. And he doesn't do it again and again and again. Now, what would you have God do? When a man, six feet of clay, turns around and persistently says no, would you have God saying, it doesn't matter? I don't care how many times you insult me. Do as you like. Of course you wouldn't. Would you respect a God like that? A God who in the end said sin doesn't really matter. I'm going to love everybody. And everybody's going to be converted eventually. And sin doesn't matter. You can blast somebody's brains out with drugs. You can destroy somebody's home with your immorality. But it doesn't matter. God's a God of love. You wouldn't respect a God like that. Nor would a God like that have a heaven for anybody to go to. Because when Pharaoh refused God's gospel, God moved in and fixed him and made him a beacon of light to everybody of the judgment that must follow. God endured the treatment. That's a very important word. He endured the treatment, verse 22. He endured it that he got at the hand of Pharaoh, willingly, to show us these lessons. And time and time and time again through history, God's done the same thing. God's a very long-suffering God, you know. He is a God of mercy. But that mercy does not last forever. And you can't go on tramping out over his offers of mercy. And you can't go on sinning forever and ever and ever, hoping that God will always show you mercy. Because there can come a point and a line you can cross from which there is no return, my friend. What about Ahab? You remember him? You remember he married that color, colorful lady Jezebel? And she brought in the worship of Baal into Israel, but he loved her and he let her off with it. A man who was a, a, a man who believed in the God of Israel, but he allowed all this worship of idols. Do you remember? And do you remember God was merciful to him and sent Elijah? And you remember the prophets of Baal that cut themselves and they, they went round this altar calling Baal to send down fire on the animal that was sacrificed there. And they went at it virtually from dawn till dusk. And Elijah stood over in the corner one of the most sarcastic points in the Bible. He says, uh -huh, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's, he's gone fast asleep. And he rubs it in. He says, maybe, maybe he's away for a walk. 
And old Ahab sitting over there in the corner watching it all. And up comes the prophet of God dousing the sacrifice in water until it's virtually swimming in it. And he calls down fire from the living God and it falls down and consumes the sacrifice and puts ped to the lie that Baal can deliver on anything. Was Ahab impressed? Well, I reckon he was impressed. The rain came, and he went down the mountain in his chariot, and the prophet of God ran ahead of him and got to the gates before him. He was impressed, all right. But did he change? No, he didn't change. So God said, all right, I have. I'm going to wipe you out now. You're finished. You're a lump of clay that I have made to damnation. No, God had mercy on him again. He called a fellow called Jehoshaphat up to him and they sat outside a city that he wanted to take and all his clever men came around him, all his prophets of Baal and so on. And he said, well, gentlemen, is this, is this the city to take? Should I go up? Will I live? Will I, will I be victorious? And of course, they wanted to be on his side and they said, certainly Ahab, certainly you go up and take a city. And then Jehoshaphat, I think it was, had a little quiet word in his ear and he said, you know, there is a man whom you have imprisoned who is a prophet of the Lord called Micaiah. And I think maybe you should listen to him. You put him in prison because you don't like what he says, but I'd listen to him because he's one of the Lord's men, you know. So they go to Micaiah and they bring him out of prison and they bring him along and as they're bringing him across the plain or the wilderness or whatever to where the army is, the guy who brings him out of prison whispers in his ear and said, if I were you, son, I would say that to the king that uh, he's going to win this battle because bread and water is not very nice to drink and eat, you know. You want to get on well, you just, you just tell him everything's going to be okay. So he stood up and he said, what have you to say, said Ahab. He says, well, he says, I think you'll win. Go up. You liar, said Ahab. You're lying. I know you're lying. He says, that's right, I am. And he told them the truth. But what happened? What happened? Ahab believed the lie, even though he knew it was a lie. You say, that's impossible. A lot of people do that. There are people sitting here tonight know that what the devil has given them through these summer months and autumn can satisfy no soul. They know there was a lovely Savior died at Calvary for their sin and that they ought to repent and receive him as Savior. As Elvis Presley said a few hours before he died, it's high time we were all living for Jesus. You know. But why do you go on without him? Why do you persist going out the doors of this lovely building and from the pleading of Christ and the pleading of the gospel? Why do you, my friend, go on and on without him? Because you believe the lie. You know it's a lie, but you believe it. You say, as the old preachers used to say, give me just a little longer, for the world seems oh so bright. I'll be saved when I'm dying. I'll be saved, but not tonight. You know it's a lie, the world being so bright, but you believe it. But nobody can tell me that God wasn't merciful to Ahab. Right to the very prophet who stood before him, who had lied first of all and then told him the truth, he went up and of course perished. From Genesis to Revelation, the character of God is shown as being a God of mercy, who when he works on a lump of clay, it is all evil clay anyway. But some insist on choosing evil and go on to dishonor. And some lean to his molding and become vessels of honor. Of course, they stone prophet after prophet until God says, I have one darling son and I'll send him. Maybe they'll reverence him. And in his mercy, God sent us the Prince of Peace 
and they ripped his back and made it like a ploughed field and they put a crown of thorns on his sacred head and they nailed him by the hands and they nailed him by the feet and they crucified the Lord of glory. But don't you tell me that God is not a God of mercy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Don't you ever tell me that God has not shown you mercy. It is as John Stott said so very well, if I can paraphrase it. It is not even a question of whom God has mercy on. The question is the wonderful fact that he even has mercy at all on anybody. Because none of us deserve it. Now I know that somebody cries in their heart tonight in this Bible class or watching now by video at home. Thank you for watching and listening. I would love to receive Jesus as my Savior right now, Mr. Preacher. But maybe I've gone beyond the line that you speak of. And my heart is hardened, and it's impossible for me to be saved. God hasn't any room for me. No, friend. No. The very fact that you would love to be saved tonight is evidence that God waits for you still. That your heart is not hardened by God. That you have not crossed that line. I often heard it taught and it is now my privilege to teach it in my generation. If you have one spark of desire in your soul to get to Christ tonight, go to him now. If you have the slightest desire in your heart to have your sins forgiven and to know God in Christ as your Savior, now's the time. Cherish it cherish it for I have been thinking all day long and it has been a very difficult day all day long that maybe there is someone here tonight and you'll say no once more but that once more will be once too often I plead with you all over this building Come to Christ now. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, 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 now. With all my soul, I plead with you to come to Christ. Not as an ice cream salesman would plead about his wares. Not as a cheap salesman trying to sell some fire insurance policy. Or a preacher trying to sell a fire insurance policy out of hell like some unconverted people would say. I say flee to Christ now not only because he saves from hell but because there is no other saviour. And that he is worthy of your trust. And worthy of your affection. And worthy to reign in your life. Don't say no. Don't say no once more. Come unto me, said Christ, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Yet, You can never be a vessel worthy of honor until first of all you see that you're no good to begin with. This whole passage argues that the nation of Israel were trying still to work their way to heaven. Therefore God could not use them and God cannot use you as a vessel of mercy 
until first of all you see that the clay that you're made of and who you are is evil and that you need a saviour and that he must make you anew. And if you come to Christ tonight, he will, and you'll become a new creature in Christ Jesus. You see, what's a vessel of mercy? Same lump to make vessels unto honor, and another unto dishonor. Verse 23, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. What's a vessel of mercy? <laughs> Oh, let me tell you with bated breath, my friend, as a friend of mine would put it. It's not another way of saying being a human being. Seize on the noun vessel. Vessel. A vessel is something that the mistress or the master of the house uses for his purpose. Seize on the noun vessel. It is something that is chosen in the house to do a job of work. And out of old evil clay, God has managed all over the world to make vessels of mercy. It's not just that he takes some men and women and has mercy on them. But it is that he takes men and women, has mercy on them, and then uses them as vessels to advertise his mercy to the world so that millions across the world may come to know his mercy. Hope you got that. He is not teaching God took some vessels of mercy and he's going to damn all the rest. No, he chooses vessels of mercy that they may become the very vessel to do a job of work and the job of work is to advertise his mercy all around the world they become an exhibition of his mercy the most famous one in the New Testament was Paul well there certainly wasn't any more famous what did he say that on me Jesus Christ had mercy that in me, on me, Jesus Christ had mercy, that in me first, who am the very chief of sinners, Jesus Christ might show forth all his long suffering as an example to the rest. He chose the very chief of sinners and saved them, not because he wanted to damn the others, but he chose the chief of sinners, that murderous bigot Paul, and he saved him. And he set him up in the Roman world as an exhibition of his mercy. And when God takes a man or takes a woman and makes them a vessel of mercy, it isn't that he takes them and uses them and confines the rest to hell. He chooses them that they might be advertisements of his mercy so that men might look at them and say, did you ever know such a God as that? He knew that boy at work. I think of a man in my hometown of Newcastle. He used to run a garage. He's dead and gone and to be with, gone to be with the Lord a long time. I remember him. You couldn't have called in to get your car filled with petrol, but that he wouldn't have sworn at you. His mouth was full of blasphemy. And he was converted one night in a cinema through a preaching of an Irish evangelist. And the man was a wonder to our time. He stopped cursing. The people couldn't believe it. I have a friend who lives in Portadown. And he got the swear box in the golf club for being the foulest mouthed golfer in the year. They give him a presentation. Maybe to try and sicken him. And shame him. And he sat in my house one night. I can see Billy sitting there, a huge big man. He said, Derek, he says, that I went along one day to bury his uncle who had died and I was taking the funeral service and I started up that hymn, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning break eternal, bright and fair. And the sea of the verse shall gather over on the other shore. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And he thought, well, I won't. 
and he told me he tried to drink it out of his head he tried to gulf it out of his head but one night in the middle of the night he says I got out of my bed about three in the morning I fell on my knees and I surrendered to the Lord Jesus and he says Derek I'll tell you something he said what I couldn't understand was the next day there was no cursing came I couldn't believe it he said it had all dried up he said it was unbelievable he became a vessel of mercy so that all his mates who had no time for gospel meetings or preachers or anything like that say it isn't a play I was flying on a plane from San Francisco to Chicago one day it's a long way there's a girl sitting beside me tried to get into conversation with her it's a long journey she wouldn't talk to me could you blame her So I gave up. And when the chicken came around or whatever, I sort of said, nice chicken. She said, yes, it is. Went over Salt Lake City. I said, is that Salt Lake City? Yes, it is. <laughs> and suddenly, in the middle of it all, she whipped around on me and she said, what's your job, sir? I thought, she doesn't talk to me up until now when she finds out what I do. She <laughs> <not tomorrow." laughs> so I said, I go around the world preaching the gospel. She said, the gospel? She said, I'm a Roman Catholic. I said, I'm glad to meet you. <laughs> she said, tell me, whenever you go preaching, do you tell people that they need to be born again? I said, yes, I do. Are you interested? She said there was a fellow in our class at school and his mind was like a sewer pipe. The girls hated him. His sexual innuendo jokes, his filth was awful. And he came in one day and he was changed. And she said I watched him and listened to him for three days and I couldn't believe it. And I went up to him and said, let's call him John. John, what's happened to you? And he said, let's call her Anne. Anne. I have been born again. Is that what you preach, sir? I said, yes. That's what I preach. The fellow in the San Francisco Bay Area of America became a vessel of mercy. An exhibition of God's mercy. You say, can I become one? Why not? Me, you, an exhibition of God's mercy. Why not? Why not? The same Lord over all is rich to all that call upon him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So call on him, and he'll save you, and make you an exhibition of his mercy in Belfast. In 1987. And if salvation is by good works and you're held up as an exhibition you're no use to me friend because I'm a sinner if you get to heaven by the best you can do and you're held up by God as an exhibition say now now look at her now look she doesn't do this that and the other and that's why she's getting to heaven it's no hope for me but if you who were rebellious and a sinner and a rebel against God, find the Savior and he saves you and you start to live for the Lord. Then sinners look on you and say, if God could save Jimmy, he could save me. If God could save that bigot Paul, he could save me. If God could save Mary, he could save me. And that's the way it works. All over the world, show me a sinner saved by grace. And there you will see the mercy of God exhibit it. You see, here was Israel refusing to become vessels of mercy because they insisted that good works was the way to get to heaven. And strange things were happening all around Europe and the Roman world. You go down into, you go down into the market in Corinth and here's a little Jew standing there. Paul means little. Don't know whether he was little in stature or not. But he's standing there and he's preaching to all these homosexuals and, and, and wild men and women of, of Corinth. 
one of the most licentious cities on the face of the earth. And what's he saying? He's saying, listen, everybody, would you like to become a vessel of mercy? What's mercy, Paul? Well, you see, you're sinners, and you need God's salvation, and God can save you in Christ, and God's prepared to have mercy on you and cleanse you and forgive you and make you shining examples of his mercy that'll shine through the centuries until the Lord himself comes even to lighten this strife-torn province where people get murdered every night of the week, virtually. Can encourage folk to trust the Savior because you're a vessel of mercy. God is pressing the privilege on you. Did you notice verse 24? Did you notice it? Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. If these Jews will not become exhibitions of his mercy and insist that it's good works that saves, all right, I'll go to the Gentiles who have no good works at all and who have no righteousness at all and don't have the oracles of God or the law of God given to them. And they'll believe and become exhibitions of my mercy. It was in Isaiah. It was in Hosea. And of course, the summary is that the Gentiles have obtained righteousness by faith. Verse 30. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, they haven't been saved because the law itself, he is saying, can't save. So the Gentiles, many millions of them, have attained righteousness by faith, and the Jews, millions of them, have tempted, attempted rather righteousness but failed. <laughs> Some passage, isn't it? And instead of filling you with a dread and despair and say there's no hope for me and God creates people to be damned, it's saying the very opposite. It's one of the greatest passages for the gospel and for the Christian on the face of the earth. It's got hope from the first line to the last dot. It's one of the greatest pieces of the Bible. Soak it in. Turn it in your mind. Muse on it. Think on it until it virtually gets in your very bloodstream. And get out there and be a vessel of mercy. You remember Noah? How long did he preach for? Did God create all those people there in Noah's time to be damned? He did not. He sent Noah for 120 years to be a preacher of what? A preacher of righteousness. He became a vessel of mercy. But they wouldn't have it. And they laughed at him in his boat. Ha! There's no judgment. They laughed him to scorn. But they laughed once too often, and the judgment fell. And if you laugh at this gospel, my friend, and you treat it lightly, you laugh once too often, and you'll go out over the edge, and you'll perish. I often think of it. There was a fellow there called Enoch, and when he was 65, he had a wee boy. And after he was 65, the child, sometimes when a child comes into a home, he changes things. And the father, as we say, caught himself on. And from the time he was 65 until his death, he walked with God. And he called his wee boy Methuselah, which means that when he is gone, it shall come. Meaning that he believed that when his boy would die, the judgment of God would fall. And when you work out the years, that's what happened. When Methuselah died, the judgment fell. And all Enoch's life, as he walked with God, he was conscious that judgment was coming. My lovely friend, Dr. James Boyce of, of Philadelphia, one of the greatest men of God I've ever known. He came away across from America to go to France just recently, and he came all the way here to see me. He just came to see me. And I reminded him of, him of the night he was preaching in Keswick. And I remember him telling me about it as we walked home from the meeting in the big tent. He talked about this point that all Enoch's life he was aware judgment was coming as he walked with God. And a woman came to him afterwards and said, I don't believe there's a God of judgment. I just believe there's a God of love. And Dr. Boyce looked at that lady gently and he said, Then, madam... You mustn't be walking very closely with God. Because those who walk closely with God are aware of the judgment that's coming. 
But when they believe God and they're in Christ, they're safe. And I love the way it ends. Well, you've stumbled over Christ, haven't you, you Jews? Christ has become a stumbling stone to you, verse 32. Because they sought not it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, and they stumbled. But what an end. As it is written, Behold, I lay on Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Christ became a stumbling stone. They tripped over him, and the rock offended them. Ah, ah, but what an end. Whosoever believeth on him, this very stumbling stone to the Jews, shall not be ashamed.